Anthony, thank you for joining me. It's a real pleasure to be with you, Chris. Thanks for uh, uh, connecting, and, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. You know, I sat with next to you at a restaurant in Menlo Park just the last week in February, and as we were enjoying that meal together with our friends, it I never dreamt when I, I... I thought the next time I would see you in person would be in Tel Aviv. And... Mm. In, and uh, that's not going to happen at the end of May, but it's going to happen, isn't it? Uh, no, it, it will happen. And uh, I have uh, uh, been going back and forth with Sister Magdalene uh, to um, reorganize our, our pilgrimage and to get some new dates. So we're, we'll probably be going towards the end of February and the beginning of March next year, but this is uh, kind of a little paradigm for I think a lot of people had plans in the summer and they're having to, to uh, uh, change them now. And, uh, and so this has impacted our lives in all kinds of different ways. It really has. It, it was so unexpected. I, I think we, we knew something was coming. We may have even had the thought that there would be a serious health scare. I don't think we mm. uh, grasped the gravity and the um, the extent of which this particular this pandemic has changed the world it literally has changed the world hasn't it i think so um uh you know there's a, a um there's a way in which we've been sobered from some of the um some of the kind of energy that was going on before the pandemic, you know, I don't know uh, if people noticed, but there was like an uptick or a, um, a, a, a exponentially people were getting busier and busier and more connected and more connected. And, and, um, and, and we were reaching out uh, to grasp for more and more power. And we didn't really have um, a sense of our limitations. We were, we were drunk on technology and we were drunk on achievement and uh, and we were drunk on the plans of what and ambitions about what we were going to do. But um, uh, but I, I think we we're we're kind of sobered right now and people are realizing um, the limits of our creaturehood in in ways we we weren't doing just a few weeks ago. Yeah, I, when you talk about being sober, the fact that we have to struggle to find toilet paper. I don't mean to be crass, <laughs> but how spoiled, you know, I, we went through this as a family and, and the realization that how spoiled we are in this country because I know that most of the world, most of the people in the world may not even have that. And yet, mm. and this is a, one of those cases where we just have to, uh, what do you really need? as opposed to what you really want. That's a, that's mm. a thing out of the Benedict and the Holy Rule of St. Benedict, that you have to ask yourself, okay, you, do you really need this? Or is this just something mm. that you want? And you're, you're asked to go back to the cellar a couple times because he has to ask you before you, is this something you really need? And I think mm. many of us are going through that right now. It, um, everything's been taken from us, hasn't it, Anthony? I mean, our, I've, I've seen it. Uh, chronicled by many people, you know, are are the idols of our sport sports and sporting events, even going to a movie, going to a movie theater, and uh, going to a concert. All the things that we that felt so important now has just been like there's a, a hush. Everything has had to come to a stop, and that it, it yeah sobering. I, I mean. <laughs> So, so, but you know the reason why having moments in our lives where we're we're sobered a little bit from um, the kind of the 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 cacophony that we can often get caught up in is you know God created us to love and uh, so that we can reveal Him to the world and when we're just caught up in the busyness uh, of the workaday world, and we're letting that define our relationships, and 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 we're caught up in uh, the next activity, and we're not taking time to be with God and to 
uh, spend time with him, uh, he can't communicate to us um, the graces that we need so that we can love one another. And, and I think the experience of many, many people that I've talked to is that they're finding right now in their lives an opportunity to return to prayer. And in returning to prayer, they're, they're rediscovering what is truly important in life. And, uh, and all of a sudden, they're starting to reconnect with family members and friends. And they're um, more aware of uh, some of the struggles that um, different, different people in their lives are having. And they're concerned about that. Uh, and, then, and then we all know people. We all have friends and family who have been impacted by this virus directly and maybe have had to face some very scary moments. One of my uh, very close friends lost his, his father. Mm. And um, I, I, I is a friend of mine from Italy, and it just um, uh, happened so fast. And so his, his family hasn't even had an opportunity to grieve uh, about this um, yet. And, uh, and at the same time, um, the kind of the shock of this has gone through his family and uh, with his children. And uh, um, at the same time that's going through, uh, he's, uh, I would say his spiritual awareness, even in the midst of shock, is extremely heightened. And, uh, and, and you know, we, we had the powerful conversation about the, the need we have right now in our homes and households uh, as we're isolated or uh, under shelter uh, to return to love, to return to the, the basic reason that God created us uh, to be. And that is we are made to praise God. And who is God? God is love. And how do we praise him? We praise him by making love known. And that's, that's our, our great task right now. Yeah. It, it, it has caused us for many for children to come back to the parents' home, uh, or maybe mm-hmm. uh, it, it has had married couples who haven't had a chance. They might be empty nesters, and all of a sudden, now they're back together in the home, and they're rediscovering themselves. You know, we also know people that are maybe having to be isolated in an apartment in New York City. There are people that mm-hmm. will will hear that and. Uh, these times, it's as though God had just, uh, he allowed it. He doesn't, he doesn't, he didn't make this happen, right, Anthony, but he has permitted it. He's allowed it. I mean, how, or how should we look at that? What, what is the mindset we should have for that? Well, the reality is the way uh, many of us have been living our lives um, at at this uh, uh, hectic breakneck pace that we've been living uh, a pace of life that doesn't allow for prayer and sometimes crowds out moments what those tender moments that where we should spend loving one another. Mm-hmm. We haven't been living like that. Uh, uh, we've let ourselves get caught up. And, w- um, and somebody could say, well, no harm done. But no, yes, harm done. You know, we've, we've opened the door to, to evil forces. I, I would say we've, we've opened the door to Satan. And he wants to destroy this world. He wants to, he hates humanity and he wants to destroy humanity. So he, uh, so when we open the door to him, he's going to kick up something like a virus and to cause fear. He's going to kick up fear uh, to crowd out love. He's going to kick up greed and grasping and anxiety and all of these things. He's going to, he, he's going to try to um, unleash on the world through through this virus and so um god isn't the agent of the of evil and uh, uh god is not a murderer he doesn't delight um uh when people suffer and and it brings him no pleasure when somebody's life comes to to an end and they're not prepared for it uh he he instead he loves life that's why he created it mm-hmm. and he loves humanity that's why he created us and he loves when we love one another. That's why he gave us time and circumstances and family so that we learn how to love one another. And God is on our side. And God is taking his stand against 
Satan and evil and human evil too. He's taking a stand against that because he wants the door closed. He wants us to love one another. And as we learn to one love one another, this virus um, that's threatening us right now, it will lose its power. Love is even more powerful than a virus. Mm. Uh, that's uh, Love is more powerful than death. And that's revealed to us in the sacred scriptures. And, um, and it's what our faith is based on. And it's what we stay grounded in now. I think that's so important for us to remember. I mean, this, on a global scale, it seems unprecedented. But the type of effect it has on the family and on a local level, uh, a, a state or a providence, whatever that might be, a province, um, it, this is not new. I mean, when you go back and you look at the lives of the saints, so many of them have lived during times where absolute annihilation came to village, to a village or to a city or to an area and uncertainty and fear and wondering where food is going to come. And in those moments, that they their faith sustained them. Many of them wrote about it. Many of them uh, tried, not so much even about the events of the day, but what that was their source of grace and for their hope. And, and you've studied so many of those, haven't you, Anthony, of those saints? Yeah, um, it, it's true. You know, we can um, even look at uh, the lives of some of the big saints that we know about, like um, uh, St. Francis uh, uh, of Assisi. Um, you know, he was... He was hanging out with lepers, and that was considered the ugly thing of his day. And other Franciscans during time of plague, or earlier than that, in the early church, we had uh, Pope Gregory the Great. Uh, uh, he he, um, uh, and all, all the evils that looked like a whole world was coming down around him, and uh, and yet uh, he led the church into a deep prayer and into a deep love. And devotion, and he helped people find courage to face the controversy of the time. And as a result, there were a lot of great saints. Saint Augustine himself, um, uh, uh, he, when he writes *The City of God*, probably his greatest work that he ever wrote. He was writing it as the Roman Empire was falling down around him, and the the purpose of *The City of God* was to help us see that um, what God was doing. Um, it goes side by side with all the evils that uh, are unleashed in the world and uh, and all the disasters. God always does something beautiful in the midst of it. And if we have eyes of faith, we can choose to live in the beautiful thing that God is doing, even as we're facing disaster ourselves. So we um, we have been privileged with the opportunity to do the same thing that um, – the great saints who came before us in the faith uh, did in their time. This is a time for great sanctity, great courage, and um, and great love. It's difficult, I think, for some right now, maybe not everyone, but for some, uh, th- the anxiety that comes not only with the illness, because this, I mean, this is one of those that, I mean, when you watch the news, listen to the news, it could come, in many different ways. And so you have to be perpetually on guard. But then the the loss of a job or the struggle, the observance of an economy, maybe a, a couple that has worked so hard and done everything so right and is prepared for this time so they wouldn't have to be dependent on their children, wouldn't have to be dependent on others. They're watching their 401Ks, all that stuff, just go whoosh. And there's an uncertainty mm-hmm. about um, all of that. And so that anxiety is something that I think is very real in the lives of people right now. Sure. And um, uh, and that's what I mean by being grounded in, um, grounded in something that's more firm. If we allowed ourselves to be grounded in our 401ks or uh, our mm-hmm. careers – or the comfortable house, or whatever other earthly dream that we have right now, if that's where our grounding was, well, that 
that ground is not strong enough, it's not firm enough to sustain the weight of our existence. And that's where the anxiety comes in. Um, but when we are grounded in God, God who is love, and we let, allow ourselves to see from his perspective, his perspective of eternal love uh, that uh, breaks into our time, uh, then then all of a sudden uh, so much of the things that uh, get turned upside down uh, take their proper place rather than rob us of um, the peace that is meant to be ours for for our own free spiritual center. We're we're not as vulnerable when we're rooted, grounded in God. And so this is kind of a, a radical kind of thing. At the same time, there's um, there's another kind of anxiety that I think is a good anxiety mm-hmm. that we should also be feeling here. And the good anxiety is the anxiety we should feel for one another out of reverence for Christ. Uh, the anxiety that we have for our friends who are all alone right now or who have gotten sick mm-hmm. or the anxiety that we have for our brothers and sisters who have lost their jobs and are trying to figure out how to put food on their table f- to feed their 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 children or um, or our brothers and sisters who are elderly and who are not sure how or, or when they're going to be taken care of. Mm-hmm. Um I, I know a very saintly couple uh, here here in California, if uh, I could tell the story about them. Um, I hope, uh, I hope uh, Deacon Ray and Donna don't mind me telling the story, but I'm going to tell the story. Um, Deacon Ray and uh, uh, Helgeson and Donna are friends of mine, very good friends for lots of years. And um, they were on faculty at Steubenville. He's a deacon for the Diocese of Sacramento. And he invited me a few years ago to go up to give a retreat at his parish. And um, and when he invited me to go up to give this retreat, mm-hmm. we um, uh, there were terrible, terrible fires and mud storm, uh, mudslides and things that had... Uh, 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 come through where I was staying in Southern California. I was just outside of Ventura and I actually had to drive through a fire to get to his parish. Now his parish was in a little town, uh, 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 in the mountains and the name of the town was paradise. And I, uh, and so when I got up there, I said, you know, on the very first presentation, I, 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 I shared, you know, I, I came through hellfire to get to paradise and everybody laughed. And, um, and then I talked about the faithful who in the, uh, that I knew in Ventura is part of a men's group. And while the fire, this, uh, Thomas fire came down on the city of Ventura, um, it was, um, it was the people of faith who were in my men's group who were standing out in front of their neighbors' homes with garden hoses and shovels, putting out the hot ash to protect the houses, their own houses, but also the houses of their neighbors. Wow. And, uh, and they were the ones who stepped up and provided home for the homeless um, men and women who lost everything. And, and these uh, men of faith, um, uh, their, their prayer group, uh, it, it, it was a men's ministry and uh, it was nicknamed O Dark 30 because they got up so early in the morning that um, I, I was with them whatever hour it was, but I couldn't tell you what hour it was because it was so early. I, I, uh, I don't even know what, the, uh, what time it was. But these were the men who stepped in the community and by their faith and by their love for one another, took care of those who were affected by this terrible tragedy. Mm-hmm. And, I, and, I, and I told the people that uh, at this parish mission, I said, I said and, um, and I believe that God has sent me to you to prepare you because someday this community will also be tested. And now is the time to return to the Lord now is the time to root yourself in prayer. Now is the time to love one another. 
because your faith also will be tested. Well, um, everybody knows the terrible campfire that happened up above Paradise uh, that later on that year, uh, or the, actually the, the, the next year, uh, uh, where um, the whole town burned down in a matter of, of just a couple hours, uh, uh, tens of thousands of people displaced by a, a horrific tragedy, many, many people losing their lives. And, um, and it was a fascinating thing to me. I drove up to uh, Paradise with Father, with Deacon uh, Ray Helgeson and, um, and his wife Donna. And we, we looked and we saw that um, most of the buildings that survived, and there weren't very many that survived, but the buildings that survived for the most part were churches. Wow. And including the parish church uh, that I, I'd given this message at, it was like it was like the fire uh, burned all around but wouldn't touch the church. And that and um, and so I I did another mission for uh, uh, Deacon Ray's parish. We couldn't meet in Paradise. We we met at, in another parish down in Chico, and uh, that was hosting the parishioners who lost their homes in Paradise. And um, and we talked about what happened together, and and they shared their stories, their heroic stories of faith and hope and trust in God and learning to love one another. Well, there's much more I can tell you about uh, uh, Deacon Ray and Donna, but uh, because that wasn't the only trials that they faced, but God brought them from uh, where they lost absolutely everything and it prepared them for what's going on right now in this pandemic and what it prepared them they learned to be detached from all earthly things in this world they love earthly things they love their families too and all those relationships mm -hmm. and all the memories that they lost in that house they had to let go of all of that and to more radically trust god but uh, because of um they were spiritually prepared, uh, they were able to enter into uh, the grace of the moment. And so they, the evil one had his disaster. He had these terrible fires in California. So that, that The evil one did what he was going to do. He visited hellfire on, on the earth uh, in our earthly paradise. But he was not able to rob these people of their faith. And he was not able to rob them of their love for one another or their mutual concern or their courage. Mm. In fact, the more afflicted they were, the deeper their courage, the deeper their faith, the deeper the love for one another. Well, just like the communities of Ventura and Paradise had to face these things early on in a way, anticipating the trial, the current trial that we're under, uh, I think we're challenged to follow their example. And, uh, and their example was in the face of the loss of all things, they keep kept their eyes fixed on Jesus. Jesus said in the gospel, though sun and moon fall away, the son of man will remain forever. And if we keep our eyes fixed on him, he's going to root us in love. And no matter what comes, no matter we face the loss of all things, He's going to provide for us, but we need to trust him. Mm. Yeah, that, that fearless trust, it, it really has to be that, because it, it, that's the one thing I think I've, I've heard that in the gospel, Jesus said more, the three words, more than um, love your neighbor. It was be not afraid, be not afraid. Mm. And that's, th that fearlessness, that's, that's tough. That I'm, it's almost you have to surrender that too. You got to you. I mean, this this is why I, I think it's so important that we um, go deeper in prayer. And it's mm -hmm. more than just saying. And I and I say this in all reverence and love because everybody is trying to understand what's happening. But it's more than just saying a lot of words, isn't it? It's more than that's important. It's important to be able to articulate and to. And sometimes the, the prayers that we have help express when we don't have the words off the top of our head. But 
there's a little something a little deeper that is being called of us, isn't it? Well, I you know uh, what you're talking about, Chris, is is mental prayer, mm-hmm. uh, and this is prayer that arises from our heart. And whenever we pray any vocal prayer, even if it's a a prayer that's written out. Um, all our vocal prayer should come from this deep place of our heart. Mm -hmm. And what is this deep place of our heart? The the deep place of our heart is where God dwells with us. By baptism, um, Jesus and the Father have sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in us as in a temple. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, Jesus is there, and so is the Father. And so we have this eternal love that dwells in our hearts, that nothing in this world can take away. And if we send, all we need to do is, is repent and that life begins to come back to us and um, uh, uh, repent. And right now we can't go to confession. Most of us can't. But if we repent and we have the intention of going to confession and we go to confession when we can go to confession, that grace of forgiveness is already working itself out in our lives and we're already being healed of the wounds of sin. And, um, but, but for that to work out, that kind of contrition that is a gift from God that heals us, for us to work that out, we need to be personally present to God who's chosen to be personally present to us. It's a heart to heart. It's a very simple movement of faith. And so when we begin our prayers, we begin our prayers with the sign of the cross. We, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And when we, we do that action, that action, when I say in the name of the Father, I should be thinking about the Father. My heart should go to the Father whom Jesus has revealed to me at such great price. Jesus has revealed the love of the Father to me at the price of his own blood. And so I should let myself be aware that the Father loves me and that he's taking care of me. Uh, The the first thing we profess in the creed is the hardest thing to believe of all, especially in circumstances that we're in right now. I believe in God the Father, the Almighty. This means I believe in a God who is personally implicated in, in my happiness. That's what a a true father is, somebody who's implicated in the happiness of his children. I uh, I believe in God the Father, the Almighty. Not only do I believe that God the Father is personally implicated in my happiness, but he's almighty, meaning he is behind all the things that are going on in my life to uh, bring about something so beautiful in my life that no matter the sorrow or the evils that I must face, the beauty of the thing that he's accomplishing in me is so much more. All of that is as nothing. And um, and if, I, if part of it is facing my weaknesses, my inadequacies, my voids, or certain hardships and total disasters and catastrophes, if part of his trying to bring about this beautiful work in me involves those things, those things cannot dim his power. He will bring about what he wants to bring about in me. All he needs is my trust. I need to, if he loves me as a father, I need to love him as a son or daughter. And all of this we call to mind when we say, in the name of the Father, and then in the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. Each of those divine persons we could reflect on at the very beginning of our prayer and think about their presence to us and how much they love us and how much they're holding nothing back for our sake and how much more concerned they are for us than we are for ourselves, mm-hmm. than they are for our loved ones, than we are for them, than we are, they are for our welfare, than we are for our own welfare. Uh, just like a, a parent is more concerned for a young child than a young child is for himself, so God is concerned for us in the same way. And, uh, and he's in control, and he's going to orchestrate what's going on, even in the midst of certain disaster, so that something very beautiful and good will come out of it if we trust him. That, that trust is something that we will be hearing 
as we that Sunday after Easter uh, that he has come. It's amazing when you think of the the uh, devotion of the Sacred Heart. He came and he it was essentially well, it's over my shoulder here, but when we were in that chapel in Paralamaniel this summer. Uh, there was a place where he came to say, you know, Sacred Heart of Jesus, I trust you. And then mm. s- several centuries later, he came to uh, St. Faustina. And essentially mm. the same thing, same type from him, from the flowing from his center and his being, he's he's imploring us, Jesus, I trust you. I trust you. Mm. And that, you know, I, that's pretty significant that the words that he would speak in apparitions, we don't have a lot of Jesus apparitions as we do Marian ones, but the ones he does, he's imploring us to trust. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Trust is how we show our um, our love to God. And so when we find ourselves getting worried and, and anxious, so worried and anxious, that it affects the way we relate to the people that are in our household with us or that are reaching out to us. Uh, that's a, a sign that maybe the Lord is inviting you to a deeper trust. So be and now today is the day, uh, this time is the time for us to be aware of how we're interacting and what we're letting drive our interactions. And when you see it's not trust in God, simply complain to Jesus, Jesus, give me deeper trust, because obviously right now I'm not there. And uh, and Jesus will uh, give you other and new opportunities to trust. This time that we're in right now is um, is a time of, um, it, it's a time of profound um, uh, uh, testing, yes, but it's also a time of uh, profound solidarity with Christ crucified. Uh, If you think about this, what we're going through right now is kind of like a prolonged triduum. Uh, uh, When the last liturgy that we had uh, in uh, Lent together, the last time you were able to go to Mass, the last Sunday that you were able to go to Mass, um, until when we have Mass again, this is like one long triduum, one long Good Friday and Holy Saturday. And um, on Good Friday, uh, it's true, you can receive uh, in the liturgy the pre-sanctified, uh, the Eucharist. Uh, and and some in some parts of the country have had the opportunity to go to a communion service, and God bless you if that's the case. Um but we're not able to go to Mass. And so that's what I mean by it's like a triduum. And then many more of us, we're not even able to go to communion. Uh, um, you know, uh, mm-hmm. And so we're, we are, um, uh, we're in this time of waiting and praying for and having vigil for the coming of the Lord. And, uh, and it's true, we can watch Mass on uh, 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 on social media, and I hope everybody is, and we can make acts of spiritual communion. And it's true that when Father offers Mass, even though we're not there, mm-hmm. his offering of that Mass is unleashing power in the church, power that gives us the ability to sustain our devotion to the Lord. And so um, and so we're so grateful for the priests who are offering liturgy for our sake. All of that's true. But um, and so in that way, it's a little bit different than the triduum. But at the same time, for, for us existentially in our homes, it is like a prolonged triduum where we're waiting for the resurrection of the Lord, his resurrection in the body of the Christ, is a resurrection that will uh, uh, unleash the sacramental powers of the church in our, in our lives in new ways again when we can tangibly receive the sacraments again. And... Um, and so what, it, what do you do during time of vigil and the time of waiting? You, you exercise prayer and you fast and you return to works of mercy, the works of mercy that you can do, whether they're corporal or spiritual. Um, you, uh, you, you, the, the fasting of this time, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, can include not only food, um, and I, I recommend bread and water fasts, especially on Wednesdays and Fridays. 
but uh, but it can include not only food, but it but it can also include, you know, how much time we're spending um, consuming entertainment, uh, you know, binge watching movies, you know, a couple days of that uh, at the beginning of this thing. Okay, but at a certain time, it's kind of empty, and you need better stuff for your food for your soul. And so rather than binge watching movies, maybe we spend a little bit of time reading the sacred scriptures or reading um, a good spiritual book or uh, or some other some other thing like that. So um, um, uh, uh, anyway, these are the gifts that that are being poured out to us right now. Chris, I'm mm-hmm. really sorry. That's but OK. I'm going to have to. Uh, call a conclusion to our our interview just right now because um, uh, uh, some of my responsibilities here are requiring my attention presently. So, uh, but it, it's been a delightful conversation with you. How about if I give you the last word? Thank you. That's uh, that's all I want to say on behalf of so many people, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, you have broken open the depths of prayer. You're the good son of Elizabeth of the Trinity. And I think this is her time. I mean, you were preparing us for over a decade or more to to hear her call to remain in him. And uh, we just all love you very much. Everyone, thank you. That's the last word. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chris. What a great interview. Have a great day, and we'll be in touch soon. All right. God bless you, Anthony.